please allow me to introduce our speakers first. They are Ms. Luz Rachel Poe, the founding partner of Migrant Women in Business, Dr. Natalia Turkina from RMIT University, Mr. Ben Vasilio, the CEO of Youth Project Limited, Ms. Bi Heng Jiang, the Director of Philanthropy from Polynate Group. So in our ever diversifying society, we are becoming more and more concerned with not only the lives that have come together, but also the quality of life the groups of people are experiencing within communities. As we become more aware of our needs as a people and a community, both so, so, um, socially and economically, we have realized that all members of our communities needs to be able to participate in society and have access to opportunity at all levels. From being after job acquisition and access to service to connecting with family members and accessing personal interests, communities are enriched with um, when all experience when we all experience social inclusion. So social inclusion is about people being able to participate in society. It is about creating conditions for equal opportunities for all. And it requires that all individuals enable to secure a job, access a service, connect with family, friends, work, personal interests, and the local community, deal with the personal crisis, and have their voice be heard. So this essentially means that a community is practicing social inclusion can involve as a whole with no one being unjustly uh, left out. So for tonight, each of our guest speakers will share their work, research, social project, and stories, and shed a light on how to promote this theme across different communities and groups. Um, I'm thinking uh, we are starting from Ms. Luz Restrepo and uh, talking about migrant women in business. I'm going to hand over to Luz. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to tell a story with photos. Mm -hmm. uh, probably it's my first time talking in a, my first speaking engagement online. Thanks. <laughs> I need to understand how to connect with you all that I feel like you are here with me. Uh, I put this photo because this was the last speaking engagement that I see. I did at CISA, at CISA Awards as a founder and as a CEO. Uh, this was with United Nations Women during International Women's Week. I had the privilege to go with them and with the Aborigine, a, a startup group of Aboriginal women in Australia called, uh, called Real Futures. And with Wendy, that week, the leader, the original woman in charge of Real Future, I understood the difference between to connect and to conquest. The Western people, we are always thinking in conquest, the world, is compete with others, be the best. And she taught me that the end is around connect with the land, connect with the other, try to understand who are the other, to understand how we, we work together. And it's incredible how the first people of this country and the first women of this country has a lot to teach us if we connect with them. I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who are custodian this land and the origin of all the countries around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I have no idea. My, my, my reflections today is around why in this time of coronavirus time, we need to help, we need to understand that entrepreneurship is a way to become a leader for migrant women. We need to learn how to pay our bills by our own, in the sign that probably on the unemployment is increasing, migrant women with unemployable in this country 
has few possibilities to get a job in this time. Uh, I'm going to tell my story to understand what, how entrepreneur we think and how entrepreneurs are linked with uh, leadership. Uh, the first photo is my business in Colombia. I started to be an entrepreneur in Colombia when I was 35 years old. When I was 35 years old, I wanted to change of profession and I was not happy to be an employee. And when you are 35 years old in Colombia, you are too old to start a new, a new career. Uh, and if nobody wanted to employ me, I start my own business. And this is my first a business probably connected with my profession and my, my background. And we were developing games to do business plans, marketing plans, strategic plans with big corporations. And slowly, slowly I become, I start to become a entrepreneurs and with time is to work with corporations. I start to work with unions and universities and uh, working with unions and universities put me in risk. And 10 years ago, I came to Australia as a political asylum seeker. As a political, political asylum seeker, that probably uh, the thing that put me in disadvantage that time was no to be an asylum seeker, something that we don't know that this exists. Uh, we beca I become vulnerable because I didn't speak the language, I didn't know anyone, and I just have money to pay my bills for a short period of time. So I become in the poverty line of Australia. Um, as a businesswoman working all the time outside home, uh, probably in, in a new country as a mom, and I am going to start to talk about moms, Moms, we become the carers of the family. Our priority are no work. Our priority are families. And we move backwards while our family move forwards. And these are my first English classes made. In free English classes in outdoor community centers, I start to meet migrant women, the Samata kind of visa. This is not a thing that put us in disadvantage. The thing that put us in disadvantage are different things. These women were lack of English, lack of confidence, long-term settled, long-term unemployed, full of domestic violence, full of, the, of discrimination. And my question six months after when I become the teacher of them is what make me different? why I could learn the language and understand how to navigate in this country. And they were here more than 20 years and they were struggling. Why? Just in this moment, I understood that one of the things is that you are not going to learn another language if you are struggling between your past, your present issues and your future aspirations. Uh, these women are, we all are doing our grief for the things that we lost. We also have a lot of post-traumatic problems that don't allow to move on from the past experience. At the same time, we are here struggling to be moms and to pay our bills and understand how to move forward. In that moment, I understood that I needed urgently to raise my voice because I wanted to tell the main street community things that, are, that people don't think because they don't, they don't experience. And still, Australia has 200 years of background of migrants. The moms with non-English speaking background for 200 years has been voiceless in this country. And we need to start to give our perspective from the struggles in Australia. No, the fancy, terrible things that happened with us in the, few, in the past. So as a businesswoman, I did my first business plan and my first enterprise was called Multicultural Connection Center. $500,000 for five years 
uh, five years plan projections, business plan and forecast projection. But if my English is not good, sometimes in this moment, you could imagine nine years ago, how I was trying to, to sell a project and say, for me it was clear, give me half million dollars. I could do this, but people don't believe in it. You don't have experience in this country. You don't know anyone in this country. Nobody's going to help you. And this is something that we need to learn how to raise, how to, how to improve. So I start alone in community centers with my free English classes mates. And because my background is make, if you don't have money, you need to make friends. My background is marketing. I just start to do the things that I know to do. Make noise and try to make, meet as many people as possible. And this was the way that a, a multicultural connection center started. A part of my background was doing games, indoor and out, outdoor, outdoor games. And I was trying to do the same thing here in, in Australia try to write a book because the stories of us are beautiful. But they, I, in that moment, I understood that the problem was how we are going to pay our bills. Who are going to have the power? My husband or Central Inc. Or I am going to make my money, I have the power. In that moment, I said, this is my second business, handmade by multicultural women. In my market, in mine, the, the name was beautiful, but probably nobody couldn't repeat the name. I took a couple of girls from the hand, and the first thing that we do was to go to a spotlight and do a craft. Why craft? Because if we do cleaning of factory, there is a modern slavery in this country with people with little English who, has, who don't know how who, who do not have the rights of Australia rights. So as I said, let's do craft, Melbourne loves craft, love locally made a market, and we start to make craft. Probably my first mind was to sell in shops, and in the only shop, so, shop that I sold was in Asylum Seeker Resource Center. ASRC for me is the, the first people who give opportunities. We don't need that people give us the fish. We need people giving opportunities that we learn how to work in this country. And Asylum Seeker Resource Center did this. But I was the only one learning how to make friends and my, my business partners were isolated in their homes. And I just says, okay, Luz, I am no, I, do, I am no a crafty person. I craft ideas. Uh, let's do in a different way. And we start to sell the craft together in market. So this is just a couple of photos of the first market that we were, free market, thanks to different organizations. The women were making their craft at home. They vomit the craft, craft in a table. And we were learning by doing how to, how to connect with Australia. With time, we, fa we found that this is a human family that teach and support each other. And this was the group seven years ago. This is the founders of Sister Works in markets. Doing the speaking engagement that I quite like to talk in public, uh, I start to raise awareness. And this is my first founding board of Sister Works. They knew how to do business in Australia, and I, did, I knew how to make, engage migrant women around myself. We didn't have money, no bank loans. Logic, we started as a charity. And uh, they helped me with the logo. 
I put the first photo is because it's the first design lab seven years ago. We just put crafty people to work together. And then we realized that craft don't work unless we found are not profitable, are not a business, unless we found ways to produce in line. And you can see the projection, the change of Sister Awards at that time. Last month, I left Sister Awards. My legacy at Sister Awards after seven years is to jump from a community of people uh, with, with few money in the bank to income of one point, I have, so at the moment, the, the money that we raised until May was that money. And 20, the, the business is, is still a, a strong one. Yeah, it's, it's more than 25%. Uh, 20 employees, the majority of them, amazing uh, professional migrant women with no experience in this country because mm. nobody wants to give the first job. And uh, you can see how we were able to raise with the model that we create a beautiful partner called United Nations Women. And the future of Sister Wars is connected with United Nations Women. And the future of Sister Wars is connected with the leaders that are now there in charge to lead the organization. Uh, I am now, so, uh, to start as a charity is a good point for women to get the confidence and the feel that they belong. But if we are going to make business, we need to pay as a business, not as a charity. So the next step when the women get the confidence is how they are going to learn to be a proper business person and paying for, for that and, 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 and receiving income no, is no more charity money. It's around give value that people pay for it. When the, we, the, when the woman learn in the process to pitch, like I am doing with you today, we get confidence, we raise our voice, and we deliver a message, and we become a leader. And this is now the journey that I'm going to start with another five partners that are probably here listen my pitch, listening my pitch. We are going to start a different model where part of the idea is how to share what we know about entrepreneurship with other organizations because it's not more about employment, it's about developing social enterprises where if I am a sole trader and I can employ in one year time two other people, one sole trader employing two become three. If there are 20, we become a 60. If we are 60, become a, a, a hundred and we can create an ecosystem of women in business supporting each other and women raising their voice and telling you why diversity is important to develop the economic pathways of this world that need to be sustained. I'm going to finish here saying you all that you need to go to jump to our social media and like, and we need business opportunities. Let's talk about business. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Luz. That's amazing, very inspiring story to share. As people normally say, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. That I feel exactly how your ideology and how your business vision um, to provide opportunities and the skills to migrant women in business and provide them the access and teach them how to uh, make more connections and make their own uh, business, let them be heard, be seen through their own enterprise. That's amazing story. Thank you, Luz. 
Um, before I hiding, uh, I'm handing over to our next speaker, Dr. Natalia. So I would like to um, uh, let our audience know. So once we finish, uh, all our four guest speakers finish their stories, we're going to have a Q&A discussion. So feel free to put any questions in the chat during um, the guest speaker's storytelling session or during the Q&A, just a letter, ask no raise your hand or unmute yourself, we'll uh, provide this session to the whole audience. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Natalia and Natalia is going to cover the smart cities and the so, uh, so society inclusivity. Thank you so much. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank Moral Fairground to offering me this opportunity to talk at uh, this wonderful event. I'm so uh, happy to be part of the community of people who actually on a daily basis do such an amazing things like what Luz was just talking about and other speakers will mention later. Um, I uh, probably would add a little bit dry, but hopefully not less important and um, interesting angle to the question of inclusion. Um, as you can hear from my, my accent, I'm, uh, I wasn't born uh, in Australia. I'm originally from Russia and uh, I moved here to do my PhD six years ago. And um, uh, now I consider myself Australian and uh, I'm part of this society and I find that inclusion is extremely important uh, for people like me, for example, uh, when they decide whether to stay and contribute to the society or move somewhere else. So if we talk about even, you know, globally, nationally, at the national level uh, spectrum, uh, inclusion is very important for promotion uh, of places for national uh, branding, for place branding. So every country should be directly interested in a uh, high level of inclusion because it's, it's just adding uh, to their portfolio, to their branding. And today I would like to actually talk a little bit about cities and inclusion in cities. And this is the project that we recently started with my uh, research partners from RMIT. Uh, and it's very conceptual at this stage, but I have some ideas that I find really important and interesting to share with all of you because I think they're applicable not just to uh, city management, but also to organizational management as well. Um, so basically inclusion is something that uh, is everyone discussing nowadays and uh, I think the the situation that is unfolding in the USA and the case of George Floyd and uh, uh, all similar cases that are happening not only in the USA but everywhere in the world uh, they're showing us that we are far away from being inclusive society or global community but hopefully we can move towards that um, Recently, uh, Mary Barra, as the CEO of General Motors, she wrote in her LinkedIn that she felt uh, both impatient and disgusted by uh, the whole situation and that from asking question, why is it happening? Uh, General Motors are planning now to move towards what they can do and how they can act to become more inclusive company. So inclusion is the question that is very important for organizations, for individuals, and for cities as well. Um, I think that uh, if I ask you the question, what did you feel or what do you feel about George Floyd case, you can show me a, a spectrum of uh, various emotions. I personally felt angst and, and anxiety about this whole situation and many other uh, emotions and feelings. And uh, if I ask you a question about how you feel about inclusion in your city or in your town, I think you can also think about possible um, spectrum of various emotions, not necessarily uh, negative like was the case of George Floyd, but probably 
um, negative promotions will be still there as well. So um, inclusive cities is something that, uh, or sustainable and uh, inclusive communities and cities is something that is recognized uh, by the United Nations as the one of the sustainable development goals. And basically it's a very simple idea. Inclusive city is the city that values all people and their needs equally, that's it. And uh, we need to think about spatial inclusion, social inclusion and economic inclusion to make cities inclusive. So basically having affordable housing and that's what uh, as Susanna said, will be one of the next topics for, for the such networking events. Um, having different marginalized groups being involved into the processes, so social and economic processes uh, is also part of the inclusion. And of course here we can talk about various marginalized groups and for cities it's a big challenge to actually work with all these different types of stakeholders and to make sure that everyone is included, starting with uh, unemployed women, ending with people with disabilities. Um, so that's not a very uh, trivial and simple task for city councils to actually make sure that inclusion is happening in their cities. Um, well, there is such an idea in theory and also in practice that you know smart cities the idea of smart cities can bring us closer to promotion to of inclusion and very often in in the development of smart cities various stakeholder groups are involved so it can be businesses including big corporations or social enterprises ngos research organizations uh, and most importantly actually marginalized community groups themselves uh, and here, if we look at the development of smart cities, we can actually observe an interesting uh, situation that uh, although we all talk nowadays about smart cities um, and many uh, cities have become smart, uh, unfortunately, they don't yet bring us to the, this uh, authentic and genuine inclusion uh, as we would like to see. So basically, uh, there is, uh, we can talk about three categories of smart cities. So the first category would be smart cities that are driven by technology. So basically, uh, this is the idea of how organizations, businesses with their technologies can just provide solutions for cities and how with these solutions they can improve lives in cities. Um, we can talk about different examples of such smart cities. Pretty much what's happening is that whenever cities start to tap on uh, big data solutions and uh, they uh, start to be recognized as smart cities, they can be considered smart cities one zero. Um, and uh, this idea of smart city, of technology driven smart city is quite simple because uh, it basically doesn't involve any kind of genuine collaboration with any kind of stakeholders. So it's more about provision of technologies to, to the cities. Then we can actually think about different types of smart cities, which is 2.0, when technologies are enabling uh, cities to become smart. And that already means that um, cities start to collaborate with different types of organizations and they create some kind of collaborative solutions when um, they provide these solutions to various marginalized groups in the cities and make their cities more inclusive. So Barcelona is a good example of smart city 2.0. Um, Melbourne is somewhere there as well. Uh, and uh, there are already initiatives of open innovation in Melbourne and you can see how local councils are actually trying to involve uh, various organizations in the development of some kind of solutions um, to become more inclusive. Now, the wishful thinking br would, br would bring us to actually Smart City 3.0 and some projects uh, in cities like Barcelona, for example, are already um, 
involving, they are, they are already uh, engaging this approach of uh, citizen co-creation approach. So that's the, that's the um, model which would include through genuine collaboration with different types of stakeholders. And, uh, and idealistically, that would be the type of smart cities that would bring us genuine inclusion. Uh, because what is important here is that all citizens could be involved in the process of development of the cities where they live. And all citizens or different groups within these uh, uh, communities could be involved in the development of the solutions of innovation uh, of decisions that are made in the cities. Well, how to move to this uh, smart city 3.0? Um, I think what's happening not only in city planning, but also in many organizations is that we can observe that there is a top-down, quite rational, technocratic, big data-driven approach to planning and decision-making, um, which is uh, justified to some extent, but actually we need a bottom-up citizen participation in the processes like this. And we actually don't have mechanisms of how this participation could be facilitated. We of course have some kind of best practice examples in cities like Barcelona or some cities, uh, some towns, some small uh, councils in Australia also moving towards this idea that uh, all citizens should be involved actively in the development of their cities. Uh, but unfortunately, in theory and in practice also, we don't really have some kind of understanding of what model would work um, for many cities. Um, here we actually, in our research pro, uh, team, we um, now start to develop this project and our next step would be to move actually to empirical stage and, and we will try to develop model like this. Uh, but we argue that consideration of emotions and values of all the stakeholders is extremely important in this whole process. Uh, and whenever organizations work with each other, whether it's a city council working with different stakeholders or actually just social enterprise working with different stakeholders as well, uh, the process of uh, stakeholder mapping often happens but I think what is important for inclusive projects, whether it's an inclusive city or inclusive organization, it's important to actually do emotional mapping of stakeholders. And that's something which is new in uh, theory and in practice as well. And it's uh, new also because it's very difficult to actually first learn about each other's emotions. So methodologically, it's not a trivial task. How do you know how, what emotion I have at the moment? Am I smiling? Uh, am I, am I, I'm smiling, does it mean that I'm happy or maybe I'm sad? Or, so it's, it's, it's very difficult for, for, for all of us, for individuals to understand each other's emotions, but it's very important to actually for collaborative working with each other. Um, then it's also theoretically difficult because uh, we know that our emotions don't occur in a vacuum. Our emotions are actually institutionally conditioned if you want. We feel proud because we actually feel connected to some value and norms of either our organization or our family or our country. Uh, and uh, all of this is socially constructed and it, it, has, it has some kind of connection to the broader uh, structures that we are all part of. And finally, practically, it's, um, it can be challenging as, as well because even if we know how to understand each other's emotions and even if we build these links between emotions and some broader institutions, we need to ensure that everyone's emotions are accounted in the process of including inclusive innovation or inclusive decision making because practically uh, power imbalances exist and how do we make decisions whose emotions are more important and whose emotions are less important 
And all these kind of questions, I think, is something to think about, to reflect on, and maybe to start to incorporate um, not only for city councils in their decisions on how they develop inclusive smart city strategies, but also for everyone in any kind of organization. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share. Uh, I hope uh, you, if you have any questions or you want to talk more about this project, I'm happy to discuss beyond this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Um, otherwise, um, I'm looking forward to listen to other stories that are more practical than my theoretical insights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia, for sharing the insights, um, the new insights of the smart cities. Um, we are now living in the most connected world thanks to the advanced technologies such as 5G, artificial intelligence. However, we might feel most disconnected than ever in the human, human being history. Um, as inclusion becomes integral to urban centers, how can it be extended to smart city programs? And how can technology better enable inclusion across city service, public engagement and economic opportunities? And how to do emotional mapping of stakeholders with smart city development? As Dr. Natalia shared, um, her research with us. It uh, brings us a lot of uh, new thinkings and uh, what we can do, how we can get engaged in the next uh, smart cities. Um, and how and why we need to move from technology-centric to citizen-centric smart cities and hopefully we can soon all have a modern city being smart and and exclusive in the meantime. And everyone is able to use the same facilities, take part in the same activities and enjoy the same experience. This means including people who have a disability or other disadvantage. So um, for our next speaker, uh, for Mr. Ben, Ben is going to talk um, this social inclusion uh, through his amazing social enterprise project, the youth group project, and uh, focusing on the disadvantage, the youth group and the youth community. And uh, welcome Ben to share uh, the work from your amazing uh, social project. Thank you so much, Bessie, and to uh, inviting me along. Um, what I like to do in the Zoom and, and the other platforms that we use, we're about 45 minutes in so far. So typically the butt's getting a little bit sore, the arms are starting to get a little bit jiggly. So what we do in our team meetings, anyone that's got their video on, or if you've got it off, is just stick your arms out like this. I'd love to see everyone do it, arms out, and just start to make some circles. And then go back the other way. And then over one side and then back over the other side, and then shake out legs under the table. Fantastic. You can imagine if we did that in person, how crazy people would think we are. But anyway, um, I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, right across the country. I think it's important that we pay those respects, particularly in the climate of a conversation around diversity and inclusion. Um, as Bessie said, my name's Ben Baslow. I am proud to be the CEO of Youth Projects one of Melbourne's um, longest standing and most successful um, large charities. Youth Projects was founded in 1984 in the north of Melbourne uh, and 34, 35 years on, um, we're 115 staff strong. Um, we support over 50,000 contacts each year and, and what we do is we drive pathways out of poverty. Um, we support young people and people experiencing homelessness to a range of high impact, high quality supports right across the northwest, uh, northeast, western corridors of Melbourne and Melbourne CBD. We have two pretty distinct portfolios. Uh, the first one is community health, where we deliver high impact support to people who are at risk of homelessness. Uh, we have the, um, the very well known and renowned 
living room on Hosier Lane in Melbourne CBD, um, where we provide around the clock care um, through a primary health service, which is free for people at risk of or experiencing homelessness. We have an incredibly committed team um, of general practitioners, nurses, mental health staff, dual diagnosis counselling, um, you name it, we've got it. Um, but what it is, is wrapped around all of the bare necessities that someone um, who is really incredibly vulnerable may need. So we do showers, we do laundry, we do food, phone charging, internet, uh, we do a great deal of clothes. Um, we support 17,000 individual contacts every single year through the living room. Um, we know that right across Australia tonight, 116,000 people are experiencing homelessness. So for us, diversity and inclusion is relevant because um, the system that we've created here in Australia is broken. It's not working. Um, we know that um, over 3.24 million people in Australia live beneath the poverty line. And guess what? I can look down the attendance list. 90% of the people on this particular webinar today are female. And guess who makes up the majority of those people that live beneath the poverty line? Right? And although I'm male, what I will say is being raised by a very strong, um, hardy, intelligent single mother, uh, I'm allowed to get behind that feminism movement to say, actually, it's time that we lift women out uh, and up. Um, in terms of the approach that we take, it's particularly through no judgment and very much a strengths-based approach. Uh, we also deliver a great range of outreach support. So we actually go out and target the most vulnerable hotspots. Right now on Melbourne CBD, we've got a team of um, highly qualified and trained nurses doing um, healthcare from their backpacks and they'll continue on until the wee hours of the morning. The other portfolio of services that we deliver um, are, are youth intervention services. So we, um, we support many a thousand young people every single year through our headquarters, um, just north of Melbourne up in Glenroy, um, a fantastic um, state-of-the-art facility that supports young people with mental health, alcohol and drug issues, right through to job skills training. Uh, and really what we're about is economic and social inclusion. For us, we know, particularly with COVID-19, we've seen the unemployment rate across the land skyrocket. Youth unemployment's just tipped 13% today, which I'll have everyone note is actually higher than post the global financial crisis back in 2009. Now, the northwest of Melbourne is, we know is a huge youth unemployment hotspot, and actually it's well above the national average at around 18%. So what we do is we work with young people, we intervene as early as we possibly can, and we do that through assertive outreach all the way through to case management. We work with them, we work with their families. Um, we support them to stabilise their mental health. We help them with their physical health. Um, we get them ready and up to date through modern training and productivity skills, uh, and then eventually place them into um, the open market of employment because we believe um, that economic and social participation is incredibly important to a young person's journey. Uh, we have an incredible social enterprise called Good to Go, a, a cafe, which is a training, a hospitality training cafe on Hosier Lane. Uh, and we'll be launching a new one for anyone in the eastern suburbs out in Rosanna later this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, for us, COVID-19 has been an incredibly challenging uh, environment for, for most of you, I'm sure it has been. Um, but with so many services across the city, closing down, and rightfully so, um, for their safety and the safety of their staff. What's actually happened is a great um, surge on our uh, and demand on our services has happened. So um, basically, we've had to double the number of supports available um, because the government has attempted to move, state government has attempted to move many people experiencing homelessness into hotels as a sort of short-term kind of band-aid solution. Um, but unfortunately, in those hotels, there's no basic cooking amenities, there's no mental health supports, there's not a great deal of social support. So we've had to really repurpose and re-pivot our organisation um, into supporting all of those people. But of course, with the unemployment rate um, almost you know, doubling in the last couple of months, the number of people coming into our, um, our employment support services has also doubled. And, and of course, we can't see them face to face. So we're doing what we're doing right now, which is you know, Zooming as many young people as we possibly can. Um, I, I think 
um, some of the words that the doc um, um, Natalia just mentioned were around um, authentic and genuine inclusion and particularly diversity. For me, um, inclusion and diversity seem like words made up by people that haven't been oppressed before. You know, it's this kind of strategy that we kind of think, oh, well, don't forget all of those other people over there. The really colourful people, you know, the people of colour, the gays and the queers, the women, the people with the disability, the people experiencing mental illness, the migrants, the refugees, um, the people with incredible lived experience, the people who have been homeless. Um, for those people, we put them at the centre of decision making. For them, it's about sharing their story with purpose and with impact and using that lived experience to actually change policy, to change practice. Um, for us, it can be a challenge for it not to be tokenistic. I get it. Um, but what we look to do is actually ensure that young people, people with um, you know, lived experience of drug use or mental illness or, or people who have actually slept on a concrete slab for many months, to actually come in and talk to us about what the service should look like for them. And we definitely look through a, a lens of no judgment. This is not about judging someone's story. This is about, about judging the impact we can have on their lives. Um, we know that um, sometimes that argument can be hard. Sometimes we'll be called socialists. No matter what your politics are, sometimes we'll be called lefties. Um, but really, um, there is an argument for supporting and developing diversity and inclusivity across our nation. Now that may not be just from a moral compass perspective, but it makes economic sense. We know that we deliver community health outreach services to the most vulnerable people. And we do that through some outreach. That outreach program, we've costed at around $56 per contact. So we're commissioned by the Commonwealth Government to go out and support people who are sleeping on the streets right now on the streets of Melbourne CBD. We give them social connection, we do a physical health checkup, we make sure that their mental health is stable and refer them back to a doctor. Now, what we're doing is preventing that person from getting to an emergency department. On presentation at the emergency department, it's costing $488. On admission, you double that, it goes up into the $900. So what we've got to start to do is think about, well, okay, for those of us that don't follow the moral compass. Let's use the economic argument. What we also know is for every young person who's been unemployed that we place into a sustainable job before the age of 21, every dollar we invest in that support service, we return 10 to the economy over the life of that young person's journey. That young person is more inclined to um, not be a health cost or burden, as some politicians would call it. They'll pay tax, they'll buy a house and, and pay stamp duty. So really focusing in on the fact that early intervention is definitely key. Um, for us, we also um, have talked about lived experience. For me and, and, and my own journey, I'm very, very lucky to be the CEO at Youth Projects. I've worked incredibly hard, but also I've used the power of my lived experience. I grew up in um, a very challenging environment in a very, um, I suppose, vulnerable housing commission estate um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. My mum worked incredibly hard to give us every opportunity we possibly could, but we were treated incredibly different. Not only was my mother's family uh, of migrant background, she was a single mum. Uh, and then unfortunately, after my father left, um, she, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer. So here we were uh, living on uh, a government income in a government house. Um, constantly judged for who we were and constantly judged from where we'd come from, but nobody talking about where we were going. I was a middle child, two children, older sister, younger sister. Um, and at that point in our time, I just remember feeling the heavy burden of the world looking at us thinking we weren't actually going anywhere. We weren't going to achieve anything. But my mother had worked so hard to instill into us that we were intelligent, we were capable that we were worthy and we had value to offer this fantastic world. Um, and although she passed at a very, very young age, she was 36 when she died and she left when I was 16, um, we pulled our socks up. We had some great support services, 
Unfortunately, our father wasn't around. He'd succumbed to what was then our first opioid crisis and he'd become a heroin addict. Um, and that had destroyed his life, although he's been clean for some time now, there were no supports around. So if it wasn't for organisations like Youth Projects, we wouldn't have made it out. Now, fast forward, I'm 34, same age as Youth Projects, actually. Fast forward all of these years, and there's not many voices that we can look to to say, hey, we've been on a similar journey. Hey, I get you, I understand it. So for me, when I talk to clients and I engage with them, I get it. I've slept on a concrete porch for many weeks. I've lived off two minute noodles for many a time. And just to add some additional burden and complexity of trauma, I also decided to come out uh, at a very late stage in life. Um, so on top of being poor and vulnerable, I also thought, bugger it, I'll be gay as well. Um, and again, you're judged. So for me, it's really about this opportunity, sharing our story, sharing our lived experience, but also not looking down for um, inclusion and diversity, looking up and looking across and saying, your story is just as important, it's just as relevant. Uh, and remember, the one thing that I always tell every single person is that every single time you go to vote, each one of us gets one. That must mean that we're equal. I think I've taken enough time. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Ben. That's really uplifting and really uh, inspiring personal story and amazing uh, your youth project. And also thanks for providing the safety, security, shelter for all the homeless people on the street. And I really like you and uh, Natalia covered earlier, what's the like a genuine or authentic connection or inclusion. And also you mentioned the one point I really uh, relate uh, coming from overseas, not growing up in Australia here. Sometimes we, we couldn't just uh, see the lights at the end of the tunnel. We couldn't see a role model there and can make us realize it's something we can do. And we have put more faith in ourselves if there's no role models there. I think this topic quite relevant to our pollinator groups and also the mission of a pollinator group. So um, for our first three speakers, share more the project and your research within Australia here. Now I'm going to introduce and welcome our last speaker, Bi Hung, and she is going to share some stories in a global lens of social enterprise and how through Pollinate Project can promote a social inclusivity. Thanks so much, Bessie, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. So yes, I'm Bi Hung, um, and I want to tell you about Pollinate Group. So we're a social enterprise, um, and our mission is to empower women entrepreneurs as leaders in their community to distribute products that will improve the health and save time and save money for some of the world's most neglected communities. Um, our impacts in India and Nepal. In India, we work in the urban slums. So picture the tarpaulin tents that you often see in the informal settlements um, in the heart of the city. Uh, and in Nepal, we work in some of the most remote uh, villages in Chitwan, Kailali and Badia, three regions. Most of our communities live on less than $3.20 a day. Um, many of them actually live on even less than that, about $1.90. So um, our work is quite simple. We provide women entrepreneurs with entrepreneurial skills that will then inc increase their confidence and their income and become leaders in their communities. Um, through their sales business, they sell products such as solar lights, uh, water filters, clean cook stoves, even sanitary pads. Um, they're creating and enabling widespread access to these life improving products for their communities who also live um, below the poverty line. Um, but it's more than that. I think what's really um, powerful about the Pollinate model is it's about elevating women, elevating women as role models, exactly as Bessie has said, 
um, so that they earn respect from their families, from their communities, and become role models for their children growing up. So why do we do this? Why do we focus on some of the most neglected and hard to reach people in the world? Why women? Um, it's quite simply, in India, 21% of the population lives on less than $1.90 a day. In Nepal, that's 15% that live on less than $1.90 a day. Um, but we know when women work, they actually reinvest 90% of that income back into their families. I'm sure many of you have heard that statistic before. And across India, uh, more than half of the work done by women is unpaid and much of that is informal and unprotected. So pollinate seven years old. Uh, over that time, we've trained about 650, uh, 650 women entrepreneurs and impacted about 650,000 people living in poverty. Those households that have purchased products from the women entrepreneurs, products like the solar lights have collectively saved 16 million US dollars. And by abating um, sorry, by replacing kerosene with the solar light products, they've abated uh, 65,000 tonnes of CO2. So very, very impressive um, numbers, but that's actually not the success story I wanted to share today. Um, what I wanted to talk about is a really interesting journey that Pollinate's gone through, especially over the last three or four years. Um, from what I've just said, you might have you know, it might appear that women are at the heart of our solution. Um, it is now, it wasn't when we were founded seven years ago. We are a solar light business. There was an issue with kerosene use and extreme poverty. So our six Australian co-founders, four women, um, two men, um, set up shop in Bangalore and created a network of pollinators who are essentially sales agents. They go knocking door to door, in the urban slums of India, uh, replacing the kerosene with the solar lights, providing affordable payment plans. Um, it was delivering enormous impact. It was benefiting men and women in the households. And this business just grew and grew and grew. There was demand, there was, um, you know, clearly appetite for an investment into clean energy. But it wasn't until about uh, three or four years ago, we'd extended to about four cities in India. We're on this amazing growth trajectory. And our CEO then, Alexi Seller, was, um, she was living and working in Bangalore at the time, sitting in her office with an all Indian executive team around her and realized she was the only woman sitting in the office. And then she looked at the sales team and realized these were all men. And so that started our journey around being a more inclusive um, and women-centric organisation. We started hiring more women um, in leadership. We started hiring more women on um, women sales agents. And they came and then they left. And they came and then left again. And we were on this terrible cycle um, of training, recruiting, training, investing in these women and not being able to retain them. So it was really frustrating and we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. We had to look internally at our systems and our processes and we looked externally as well. Um, and part of that work was around understanding what else people were doing, what were the other social enterprises in our space globally that were facing similar challenges. And one of the organisations that we came across is called Empower Generation. They're a um, US charity that works across um, uh, in Nepal. And their entire sales agent, uh, uh, sales network was female. And so we started speaking with their chief entrepreneur, one of their co-founders, Sita Hikari a woman who grew up in a farming family in Chitwan and worked her way up to become a leader in her community. And she fundamentally believes that the only way out of 
um, poverty for women and the only way to gain independence and respect is through entrepreneurship. She believes that women needed to create opportunities for themselves. And through that, they learn skills, they gain confidence and they gain respect. Um, but that doesn't happen overnight. You can't just deliver a one-off training session, which is what she saw a lot of NGOs doing in that time. Um, coming into her village, delivering one-off training and disappearing and then working out why things weren't quite happening. Um, they needed mentoring, they needed leadership, they needed um, uh, female role models. And so that began our kind of collaboration. And long story short, in 2018, Pollinate Energy, as we were known then, merged with Empower Generation to become Pollinate Group. And so we've now got an organisation of about 80 strong people um, focused on how do we bring more women entrepreneurs and keep them in our network. Um, over that time, we've learnt an enormous amount. One of the big, big insights that we discovered was that the design of our sales agent roles in India prevented women from participating. We were great at um, community consultation. We engaged our sales agents and said, what is going to help you? And they said, give us reliable work, give us full-time work, give us a fixed salary. We did that and that excluded women because women have so many responsibilities in the home. They cannot all participate in full-time work. Um, what else did we do? We when we first started recruiting our network of entrepreneurs in Lucknow, um, a city in India, uh, we managed to find about eight women who said, yes, I want to participate in this. Um, I want to create these opportunities for myself. I'm available on Sunday. So we scheduled a training session in our office, quite a central, easy to, uh, easy to find location, and none of them showed up. Not a single one. So on Monday, we were like showing up, okay, what just happened there? Oh, we can't travel on our own, un unsupervised or, you know, unaccompanied. We learned again about these barriers that we had created for women without even realising. And that piece about mentoring is so important, creating um, female role models so that um, women can see what they aspire towards. Um, as we were recruiting women entrepreneurs, um, I remember we were going out into the communities and saying to women, would you like this opportunity to sell, to sell products and over time you can have your own income, you can even have your own corner shop? And she said, no. And after delving in deeper, we realised she couldn't believe that that was even realistic for her. But when we have women in her community already or we introduce her to women just like her who had this um, career pathway then suddenly it's ah, okay this is something that I can do and I'm sure many of us can relate to that feeling of seeing leaders that look like the, us that sound like us to make us believe this is something that is achievable and attainable so that's, a, you know, a lot of work that we did in the communities, but I wanted to touch on some of the really interesting um, information that we've learnt about our staff as well, because, you know, to lead this kind of work, we realised we needed a workforce that was gender sensitive and, um, and conscious of uh, the barriers that women face um, and who are astute enough to identify other barriers that were still in our blind spot. We delivered gender awareness training. So CETA um, led that across the whole organisation for our staff in India and Nepal and Australia. And, you know, really eye-opening gender bias conversations, including um, one conversation with a team in Nepal who have spent years and years training, empowering, developing women um, as in their core role and one of our um, regional sales managers who's been doing this job for three or four years um, revealed to us that women couldn't be truck drivers and it was just a beautiful beautiful moment for the organization to lean in and to really 
understand, okay, let's, how do we unpack this? Why can't women be truck drivers? And through that process, we learned firstly, he had never seen a female truck driver, which is why surely they can't be truck drivers. But we also learned in a really, really safe place that we all have these gender biases and it's okay. And um, we created a safe space to unpack um, uh, and, and become learners. So before I kind of end my, um, my piece, I just want to leave one last little story. Um, and it is my favourite story from Pollinate because Amreem is a fabulous woman that I met when I was last in Bangalore last year. Um, she was actually one of our first um, female pollinators in India. So she's actually been with, um, with Pollinate for about four years. She's a mother of uh, two children. Um, and she was just one of those sales agents that stayed with the network and then has worked her way up to becoming um, a, a senior mentor, we call them field mobilizers. So she goes out and um, supports uh, new women coming in. And so she was out in the community recently and um, was saying hello to all the households. That they all know her, she's like family. Um, a lot of them have the solar lights that um, she sold to them. And she walked past one household where um, a little boy, he was about eight years old, was doing his homework um, and he had the solar light shining, um, but not quite shining on his book. It was kind of missing the mark. And so she went over to help him adjust the light and make sure that um, he could see what he was doing. And she's like, oh, what are you studying? What do you want to be when you grow up? And he turned around and said, oh, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And she was his role model. And so, you know, she gets cheery sharing that story because um, it's why we exist. It's why Amring does what she does and it's why this work matters. Thank you so much, Bi Hung, for sharing these beautiful, inspiring stories and the project our Pollinator Group has done in the past few years. Um, before uh, we open up the uh, question to the floor, uh, we, we want to quickly launch a poll and uh, want our audience to take a, a mini breather before we have more specific questions to our guest speaker. Uh, just uh, trying to uh, get a basic demographic data or idea where our um, audience come from. It only takes um, three minutes, seven, seven single multiple and multiple choice questions. And thank you for everyone can participate this survey and the poll and we'll start our Q&A session uh, after three minutes and hope our audience can uh, have a time to go to the bathroom or have a cup of tea and uh, take a breath uh, and uh, fill out today's survey.
All right, I'm just going to end the poll. If you haven't been able to um, move to the next page, you probably have to just scroll down. But if it's not working, no stress at all. Uh, would anybody like a minute or two for the poll, or would you want to continue into the panel? Probably give it another minute. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for the poll. I think we can start with the panel now. Over to you, Bessie. Thank you, Pavi. Um, thanks for everyone. Take a minute joining our surveys. And now we move to our Q&A sessions. Um, I still I encourage and welcome all our audience. Uh, please put your uh, questions in our chat box. If you have any questions or message us individually, if you like, and we can uh, ask these questions on your behalf to our panel. So to make it start, um, I want to ask some questions for myself. Uh, we all hear, we all heard all four speakers sharing their project or research project, um, what the inclusion means through their work. Now I want to get more ideas for our four speakers. What does inclusion mean and look like to you as an individual? And how does your workplace support it? Um, shall we start uh, from Luz? <laughs> I, I think I think many of us, we have a very Western mind. We think the world, the, the, the people who, who live in a Western city, more or less, it doesn't matter the, the city that we born. We were raised in the similar way. We all went to primary school and, and study from Monday to Friday, weekends free, we have a toilet, we have kitchen, we live in our families, we dream to get a job, to get married, to have children, to buy a house, and, and not necessarily everybody and all the cultures have the same. And uh, there are also in the different cultures, there are the non-verbal rules that sometimes we are no able to learn how to read. To put an example that Natalia took in her speech around how the different cultures manage the emotions and uh, the, these non-writing rules of the emotions can make difference between, between cultures. In my own experience, to put an example, a uh, Instead, I grew up in a city and from Latin American culture and people can see my passion when I am happy or when I am sad or when I am angry. But if you deal with a British person, you don't know what they are feeling. Or, or if, you, if you 
if you live in a refugee camp or born in a refugee camp or come from, come from other cultures where Monday to Saturday on Sunday doesn't matter because there is a mix between family and, 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 and work, something that we are now experiencing. This uh, how to open our heart and our mind to think beyond what we see, what is our trust, is part of the inclusion. And, and, and I think so it's key to open the conversations around that, yeah? For me, when all these different uh, uh, strong accents that are populating Australia, yeah? We need to learn how to talk with each of us, yes? Not necessarily the words sometimes are, uh, have the same meanings for the different cultures. Yes. Diversity is around, I think so, it's more about open heart uh, and generate connections. Let's go again with the emotional, uh, I, I, Natalia, I forgot, the emotional connections. Well, yeah, we, or stakeholder yeah. or mapping or emotional. just understanding, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and try to, to build this in a smart cities. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, what do you think, Natalia? What does uh, inclusion mean to you or looks like to you? That, yeah, that's, well, first of all, thank you, Luz. I, I don't know what else to add, to be honest. Uh, I think it's a really... Uh, and we all know it's it's not a just I think it it's we all know that it's a, such a big question that it's very difficult to answer it in in uh, in a very short and um, concise form. I think inclusion means to me that um, I can do, feel, uh, act, speak the way I uh, want. Of course, within legal and you know. Uh, normal um, normative frameworks on this society but um, that I don't I don't feel about how but I feel uh, sorry I don't think about how but I actually think about what I don't think about how I sound I think about what I say and um, I don't think about how I look and I think about what I deliver to the community I don't think about how people perceive me, but they see what I'm doing for them. So I, I think once all this fit together, then we can talk about inclusive community. When you, as an individual, don't spend your time on um, thinking about how to fit in, rather than thinking about that you're already part of this bigger whole, and uh, you you just uh, an important part of this uh, bigger community and um, i think it's in today's world when we now face you know the covid crisis and uh, all countries are separated physically and people within communities are separated physically and uh, we are divided and um, at the same time, we are collaborating more than ever. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, at the global scale, now we will have more, I think, uh, of nationalistic uh, ideas and ideologies and political movements, and probably it will happen, uh, especially in those places where it had started to happen or started to happen before COVID crisis. Um, and I think very often the, these ideas, uh, they hide by the uh, broader idea that identity is about something that you need to protect and you, you need to, uh, how to say, keep uh, untouched compared to other identities. And it's all about comparing. But I think actually we can still keep all our identities within a bigger whole and uh, we don't need to lose any of ourselves and still be very um, productive and uh, very and happy together. 
So that's for me what, you know, and you can, you can scale it to different levels, to level of organization or to level of the whole society. Um, and the, if I talk about um, my organization, uh, RMIT at the moment, um, I used to be at University of Melbourne before and now I'm part of RMIT. Um, actually, I'm proud to, to say that RMIT is a quite inclusive university. It has been actually officially recognized as one of the, as the, the most uh, inclusive university in Australia in, uh, in terms of LGBT community, for example. So um, I think, um, well, research has shown already that uh, diverse teams are more productive and more efficient than non-diverse teams. Research has shown that inequality within countries uh, causes uh, higher levels of unhappiness within countries. So it's our all interest to actually be more inclusive and be more diverse and to embrace this uh, uh, all um, concepts in practice because in overall, uh, after we do this, uh, everyone individually will be more happy. Bravo. Thank you, Natalia. Before getting to Ben, uh, we got a question from our audience to Natalia. So, uh, if you don't mind, I will uh, I will ask this question first. So, smart cities are clearly technology driven, and uh, women sister works are working with the people in the low socioeconomy population here in Australia, which means who are already marginalized and excluded from technology and do not have access to be inclusive. At the current situation, COVID has demonstrated this even more as not being able to be connected online. So the question for Natalia is how do we deal with this disparity and the inequality of access? Well, I think that's exactly what uh, cities should achieve at the minimum level to, to make uh, um, to make decisions and to adopt policies and, and practices in uh, um, that would give this technological uh, access, tech, uh, uh, digital access to everyone. And, uh, and very often the idea of smart city ends there. So it's just about digital access. Uh, whereas uh, I think it, the, the whole concept of smart city should go beyond just uh, technologies. And although I, I clearly understand that it's very important and when we have connection and we have laptop and, uh, and telephone, we take it for granted and we start to think about other things, how to collaborate, how to you know, do emotional stakeholder mapping, all this kind of stuff. Whereas those people who don't have uh, very basic things, obviously it's important for them to, to give access to those basic things in the first place. But I think that's, that's the minimum uh, requirement for not just a smart city, for any city to make sure that their citizens, all of them are included in this sense and then also in many other senses. Uh, and that's, unfortunately, I don't have an answer how to do it, but uh, that's a very uh, challenging task for, for all cities. And, uh, and obviously we are doing way better here in Australia than in many other parts, parts of the world. Behen, how you are doing in, with Polunate, with technology? Yeah, it's actually, it's an interesting question because I was just reflecting on how um, with everyone working from home, that's created um, ways of exclusion without us initially realising. So, you know, um, you think about all the times with, when you've got a global workforce, um, all the times that you potentially ex um, exclude um, colleagues either by setting up a meeting in a different time zone that's not accessible um, through to phrasing a, a sentence in a, a question in a particular way that doesn't um, really empower people to 
answer in an honest way. But one thing that's really emerged recently is um, when we got everyone working from home, not everyone had equal access to um, connectivity and it was preventing them from doing their jobs. And, um, you know, to create an inclusive workplace, you want people, you want to be able to create an empowered environment where people feel they will have a voice and that their voice is valid um, and these types of concerns can be raised but the reality is not everyone necessarily feels that through their own lived experience through either you know um, being from a marginalized background or um, in the case of some cultures just your level of seniority and so there's a responsibility in the leaders to ask those questions to to identify how, um, you know, why is it that one staff member just consistently doesn't make meetings or never puts their video on despite, you know, everyone else doing that and um, and questioning it and identify how we can, yeah, work around those solutions. Mm. I, I, I might jump in if you don't mind, Bessie. Yeah, of course. I'm going to introduce you to oh, carry on the questions. Yeah. Typical of my personality just to jump in anyway. So um, I, I think um, a really credible response here and something that we tried to create, and, I, and I, we're not perfect, but I think that we've done quite well, is using the power of vulnerability. Because if you create a safe space, particularly in the work, to the table because they'll look up to the leaders and go oh, okay they've been on a journey they've had some challenges life is not perfect for them and what it does is creates this really safe space where people feel okay to talk about the challenges that they've faced but what we have to be conscious of is that those conversations aren't creating an air of dwelling and by dwelling i mean focusing on the past what we do is we use the past and we use our experience as a springboard for the future. And I think that's, that's really powerful because many people face many challenges and whether you can see it or not, everybody has their own journey. So if the leadership of an organization is creating this space to say, hey, I've, I felt that and I feel it and I've been through that pain, but here I am today, here's an outcome, here's the impact that I'm able to create today. I think that's incredibly important in terms of creating diversity and inclusion without it just being a policy that sits on the shelf. And what you do is you then surround yourself with people who really want to be diverse and inclusive, but actually those people become um, the decision makers, the people of colour, the people of, um, you know, um, many genders and many, uh, um, you know, sexual persuasions and disabilities and backgrounds. Um, as you would probably see today, I mean, we're all connected to each other because we are diverse and we are inclusive. So if you create that within your own work environment, you get such authenticity, which is absolutely amazing. What we've got to be conscious of is particularly in the world that we live today, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, whatever it may be, mainstream media and a lot of the politicians have actually pushed upon us what I call where we have such a very small percentage, maybe 5% of the extreme right and the 5% of the extreme left taking up all the airwaves. And what happens is the 90% of us, the moderates in the middle feel like, and sometimes this is where the arguments start, that you have to take away something from me to acknowledge the pain of somebody else. And this goes to a question I just read from Jean around how do you create these really healthy conversations, particularly around Black Lives Matter, when there's such opposition, there's such opposition about there about moving on and we don't have to acknowledge this and as many white deaths in custody as there are Aboriginals. Actually, what we haven't done is created a safe space for those people who haven't been oppressed to talk about their pain. And if we create that safe space for them to talk about their pain, I'll understand that by acknowledging the fact that Black Lives Matter, we're not taking anything from them. We're actually adding, we're adding to the pot. We're acknowledging that a, a particular um, race of people, generations of people have been through incredible pain, through significant pain. And, and they've had to fight tooth and nail to get to where they are today. 
And we're not going to take anything from you. What we need is just to be acknowledged. What we need is our pain to be affirmed and to understand that that is not our future. Our past is not our future and we're in this together. But those that oppose it need to understand that we're not taking anything from you. Anyone that has been of any minority, women had to fight for the right to vote. Don't forget that. You know, Rosa Parks sat on that damn bus and wouldn't give up her seat for black people to get a movement. You know, my people, the queer people at, at Stonewall rioted to get to where they are today. So, you know, we've got to actually stop and create a safe space because all the people that do oppose what we're trying to achieve around diversity and inclusion have got pain themselves. They just haven't been given the space to talk about it. That's very beautiful, Ben. Thanks for sharing. And also, I got some new insights, like uh, we're all using the power of vulnerability. That's really beautiful. So to carry it on this first question, and we left uh, Bi Heng last also. And I, I believe Bi Heng may want to share the inclusivity or diversity within Polynate group. And maybe you want to share with us more stories within the workplace uh, of Pollinate Group. So, do you mean um, how we bring, uh, how we, uh, I suppose, you know, one, I'm thinking about COVID um, yeah. and because it is just so relevant to, um, well, I think, what a lot of us are dealing with at the moment, which is an environment yeah. none of us had really um, prepared for. Yeah. And, um, I guess the really sad reality of what Pollinate is dealing with is that our mission is going to be more relevant than ever as we recover from the pandemic. So to um, the divide um, in equity is just the, the gap is going to get bigger and the problems that we were facing last year are going to be more severe. And, you know, what we have seen at Pollinate is... Um, in talking about social distancing as one example, um, the privilege that that um, comes with, you know, where all of us here are able to socially distance um, reasonably well, I hope. Um, but when you live in an urban slum like India, um, like in India, it is really, really difficult. And I'm, you know, thinking about, um, a conversation I had with our head of finance, Gautham, who was out at the fish market about a couple of weeks ago, um, and just surprised that the fish market was open. And, um, he was in Bangalore and he said to his regular fish guys, like, why are you trading? Like, you, we, we're not allowed. And um, the fishmonger was like, well, you know, I can die of COVID or I could die of um, starvation. So, I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> that's my choice. And so it is um, informing how we view our communities and how we approach our communities. And um, for our company, it's, you know, that's the reality we're dealing with. So we're currently working on a number of initiatives that allows the business to adapt to a low touch um, uh, economy where uh, we're able to continue to service our um, customers and train our entrepreneurs, but hopefully with social distancing in place, we're um, relying on technology a lot more. So we're building in new capabilities to, to do all of that so that we are able to, you know, support these communities so they don't fall further and further behind. Um, but within the company, just to go back to your question, you know, um, one of those interesting things about working from home, and I suppose it's no different in India as it is here, how this has just proportionately affected women. Um, you know, we have women working from home, our staff, um, who are burdened um, with uh, caring duties and house duties and um, forcing the company to rethink how we manage a remote workforce and what um, we need to put in place to ensure that, you know, women aren't disciplined unfairly and that they are able to conduct their work um, 
within the realities of uh, yeah of the cultural norms um, yeah, within their families. So yeah, big questions that we're grappling with. Some we've um, progressed with and others we're still figuring out. And Luz, did you just put your hand up there? No, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I am just starting, yeah, starting a new enterprise, mean, start to develop new ideas and try to articulate new ideas as well. But it's clear that to change the world, yes, and to make a world more inclusive, we need more people like us, happy to share our experience and open our heart and open our mind to different point of views. But the only way that we're going to grow is to have economic empowerment. And, and I am going to take that, some concept that Nat Natalia spoke around because it's not about social inclusion is around economic inclusion, yes? And in this post-coronavirus time, it's not around generate more employment, it's around generate new businesses, new entrepreneurs who, are re who need to reinvent the world, yeah? And, oh, it, Sorry, Ben, but I am very feminist. I keep thinking that probably is that moms that needs a, the, a, this flexibility of work that we are going to create these new options, yeah? But we need to encourage ourselves to learn how to manage the money, not to think in budgets, to think in incomes, to think in generate value and no value just in money, value for the environment and value for the community, yeah? And I think so on our way that we as a diverse people have economic empowerment, our voice is going to be here. And the, the trick is how we are going to do it, yeah? And I think as be, be, him, be, 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 be be, be Jan, be Han. Hey, Han. Be Han says, yes, it's about um, uh, leadership, yes, and how we are going to inspire other people to think outside of the box, to think outside of the solution of the Western and con, uh, Western world. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. sharing, Luis. Yeah, that's beautiful. Definitely during this time of a crisis uh, or the pandemic time, everyone contemplate our life, our work, and more importantly, the community. Sometimes we even, as Bi Hung mentioned early, like social distance. In Australia here, we take it for granted, but in the country like India or Bangladesh, it's a, a privileged thing to be social distance. Um, so, uh, I believe Pavit still got a few questions or idea want to share with us also. Pavit, would you, I will hand it over to you. Yep, um, we are running really close to schedule. So I'm just gonna run one last round of questions to our speakers. And after that, we'll open up the Slack channel and share the link with everybody. So if you do have follow-up questions and just wanna continue the important conversations that we're having today um, and really connect with our speakers and your, each other, we'll open that to you. But one last question, and this is very relevant to our time today. Um, you know, over in the current state of affairs in the global pandemic, um, we're seeing humanity come together. We're really seeing different faces of inclusion. On one hand, you, can, you, you tend to see so many people, uh, boundaries just disappearing between people. They're coming together, helping each other, sticking out for each other, ensuring that things are gonna be, you know, a collective fight. But sometimes we're also seeing um, some, t some certain communities becoming more insular, where, you know, they're fending off COVID for themselves, but not really being too considerate and inclusive in their approaches. And it is, it is a stark contrast between the two. And it's not, it's not very pleasant 
um, in my opinion, because we do need to build a very inclusive culture moving forward. So my question really is around how do we ensure that we bring about a very inclusive and diverse movement that will help us recover and rebuild from COVID as a community, in our homes, in our businesses? And how does one's leadership play a very important role in that uh, movement and effort? Yeah. Whoever wants to start. I would love to, if you don't mind, Pavi. Yeah, please. Yes, Ben, please. I, I would love to present to all of you a list of practical suggestions on how we um, eliminate polarization, how we come together as a community, and I've got them. We work in that space every single day. But actually, this is an opportunity to actually talk about the system. The system is broken, is what I hear every single day. That is incorrect. The system is not broken. The system is working as it was designed. You know why? Because the system was designed by the patriarchy. The system was designed by white men for white men. That's how the system works. And what we're doing over generations is changing the system. And we constantly have to change the system. We constantly have to be advocates for change. We constantly have to be advocates for including people of diverse backgrounds. That's a really big challenge. It's a huge burden to bear for anyone that's any different to a very simple white straight male who typically runs this country and has for the last 250 years. So I think that my message is that it is okay to stand up and fight and that we must back others who are fighting even if that cause does not impact us because they're fighting for reason and their reasons are justified. When someone fights, it doesn't take anything from us. It doesn't take much for us to actually support them. So get behind them, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's women, whether it's people with a disability, whether it's queer folk, whether it's young people, whether it's old people with dementia, it doesn't matter. They deserve the rights that they were born to and we must support them. We can spend hours and hours and hours on practical negotiations around implementing and changing policy, but never forget the philosophical fight. The philosophical fight is incredibly important. Hi. I just wanted to know, is it okay for me to share something? Yes, Cam, please. Um, also, sorry if there's any noise in my background. Um, and Ben, yeah, I really agree with, your, with what you're saying there. Um, yeah, perhaps the systems weren't set up for us and for the expanding diverse communities which is why we do have to really reflect on those things and this kind of links into what i wanted to say as well i just i saw some of the um i saw a question from jean or i'm not sure how the name is pronounced exactly um but speaking about the inclusion um of you know all these different different things and different types of people that we have now i think I think it's something that we all have to start becoming responsible for. Um, we all have to start becoming aware of it because what happens is, like Ben said, um, these the, the systems that are in place currently, they're set up in such a way that they just kind of, you know, they're, they're really there to support, um, you know, the, the patriarchy. They're starting to expand, you know, a little bit here and there. Um, but I think we have to start to inquire about these things actively instead of just kind of thinking like, oh, you know, there are not that many women in here or people of color in here or disabled people in here. Just like um, Beheng was saying before about looking around the room and seeing that there, there weren't that many um, or there weren't any women present. It's the same thing that we have to do for all others. And we all have to start to hold ourselves accountable. I think a lot of the time what happens is that we're in a position where we're comfortable. We're in a position where, you know, we might not be getting challenged and our jobs or our lives or um, our social inclusion may not be challenged, but just because 
we have a privilege doesn't mean that we should stay quiet. You know, we have to keep our eyes open. So all these things that are happening from COVID, you know, showing how, um, I think it was Beheng again, who was mentioning how noticing how different employees were able to come online or not show their video or show it, whatever, or whether it's the Black Lives Matter, these events are happening and they've opened our eyes to what has been here for such a long time, but we were so comfortable that we didn't realize, you know? And so what we have to do now, now our eyes are open to these things, we now have to continue. It's for us to, to ask the questions, you know, for us to not get comfortable again and say, okay, what can we do to expand employment opportunities? How can we create these changes and not wait for other people higher up to do it for us? A lot of us are in the positions where we can change things. Um, and yeah, so we, we have to make those changes, use our voice, use our platform. Everything counts. Every, every um, position that we have, every way that we are able to share, we're in this position for a reason. We have to use our voice and the ways that we can make changes to do so. We can't be comfortable anymore and we cannot keep a, a blind eye towards these things anymore. This is just the eye opener. We have to be the creators of change every day moving forward. Bravo. I, I, I would like to add to Kim because I did a beautiful piece, Kim. I'm going to link in you who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but it's completely agree. O sea, it's, it, this is our time. And we all need to understand that we all are leaders. And we have a key responsibility and it's in our shoulders now. It's not in our children's shoulders, it's in us. And we need to take this leadership and start to change. O sea, the change starts for us. I think things big things go. I think the other thing that we also forget within this though is that we have we do have power structures and we also the people in those power structures need to be doing the work um, as well because the, the fact is women only got the vote because men stood up and said actually we think women should get the vote and so part of that is you know I, I you know I in the space that I work in. Um, I work in, with so many organizations where the entire board or the entire leadership team is white. Um, the entire leadership team has no uh, lived experience of uh, what the people that they're working with. And so, I mean, there is also work to be done at that level. And so how do we also systematically encourage those people to actually do the work? Um, because without their support, nothing's going to change. It's nice, babe. So in my new, I have a new theory. I keep working here in my journey as entrepreneur and be a CEO seven years, yeah, and try to work with entrepreneurs and at the same time try to work with employees, yeah and put a, a board that is white, that it is very diverse in age, in other things, but it's no multicultural because I was looking for complementary skills. And it's, o sea, there, is a, there is two different, different words, and we can keep creating employees with a, employees, and we can keep thinking that they, the good business models are the corporate business models. So we need to rethink our, our workplaces. Rethink from I as employee who, are, who, has, who need to have the courage to question the status quo. I can stop to no question, yes? So I, I can stop my actions because there is a boss or there is a board or there is someone else. So we need to start to challenge ourselves. And this is part of the diversity. How do we, ca we keep these conversations? Challenge, 
O sea, power, power is powerful. And we need it to challenge us when we are in the power and challenge others when they are in the power. I, I just wanted to actually add to what just Lou said about uh, status quo situation and how corporations are viewed as the business uh, which is considered to be normal business and everything else is like outside of this big box and that's that applies really well um, also for what research priorities uh, researchers do at universities and research centers and very often the priorities are uh, all directed towards these big corporations and, and, and pretty much solving their needs, uh, solving their issues and meeting their needs uh, instead of actually becoming uh, more focused on, on other more niche like social enterprises forms of, uh, of business, for example. And uh, I think that's something to be changed in academia as well. So um, that's why I think it, research like this is important and the academics should turn more towards actually different types of uh, businesses and, and social entrepreneurs are definitely amongst them. I just wanted to say, to add a little bit to what we all could do with this whole um, opportunity given to us by uh, the COVID crisis. I actually think that um, it's very important for all of us, uh, whether we are organizations or individuals within or outside of organizations, is to understand that um, we always uh, practice some form of agency and actually agency can be different it can uh, vary from being very passive and accepting things and go and you know just going for compromise with the reality uh towards uh, active agency where you take an opportunity or even further you eliminate things um i um there is a philosophy of critical realism and they uh, developed these ideas uh, um, in the last 20, 30 years a lot and they actually talk a lot about how we live in the world of opportunities, which is true, and how actually problematic it is. Because opportunities, um, the fact that we have opportunities or we see in every situation an opportunity also means that we don't change fundamentally the structures we are all embedded in. And I'm not uh, saying that we all have to have revolution right now, but basically in order to change structures, we need to eliminate some things. So sometimes we need to uh, not to take an opportunity, which is also uh, sometimes I think important to, to reflect on for everyone. Um, but thinking about the fact that we all have agency is also very important and uh, uh, we are part of those power structures as well uh, because we, uh, it's not us versus them. We are also, yeah. we are constituting those structures. We are conditioned by those structures, but we are also constituting them. So I think uh, just being reflective on every situation in our day-to-day -day lives or organizational decisions we make um, can be useful and can bring us either closer or further from more or less uh, inclusion and diversity. Thank you so much, Natalia. That's, that's an absolutely valid point and so important that all of us must acknowledge that we are part of this larger ecosystem and we all as actors have just as much of a responsibility to exercise agency. Um, Jean had put their hand up a few times. Jean, would you like to say something and then to Ben and then we should be concluding. I would love to. Thanks for that, Pavid. Um, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to organize There's a lot of thoughts I want to get out. So one of my own personal approach, my own love project is called Some of Jean, and that's to support and mentor uh, young Asian Australian women to align their life and career paths with their desires, strengths and values. And the purpose of that is to really 
work from the internal parts of themselves first. Um, and what I see here is we have to work from at, at a range, at a number of different levels. And within the Asian Australian community, we've been talking about this issue around lack of senior leadership in organisations. But what we need to do is work from a personal, societal and political slash structural um, perspective from all angles to make this change. And the other thing I want to point out is there's a risk of fatigue. So I look around the room here. We are a diverse bunch. So we're talking to the converted already. And the more that, you know, there, there's not a lot of us and there, it is a growing group, but we run the risk of fatigue when we're out there all the time speaking up and that's exhausting one from like from just the act of it and two from the backlash that we get and also the other risk that we run into is general society's reaction um, or fatigue around well, we've dealt with the gender thing now and gosh we've dealt with the lgbti you're telling me there's another thing and another thing so I think there's, we need to look at this in a, in a smarter way in that we include the intersectional um, issues and, and challenges that we have and actually tackle it together rather than one at a time, which means we need to all work together. <laughs> um, and so the other thing, the last point I want to make is we need to, and it's been mentioned earlier in the group, I think potentially by Kim, I think, or Trang, um, was that we need to, the need for finding champions who are already in existing structures. So we need to find those who are already in the mainstream who are in the position of making power or to, to use their power to support different groups. So we really need to engage at a wider uh, mainstream audience as well. I made a few points, but thank you for that allowing me to say. That was a wonderful chair and really, really, really great points. Um, things that, because uh, I guess personal power is something very often overlooked and also finding the right voices and, you know, being able to, I, I love, I love how you pointed out that there are all, there's always going to be that fatigue where, you know, people are going to be like, yeah, this is an issue. And no, why is this an issue now? And, you know, oftentimes it, it just seems, I, personally, I react to it in a very negative way. And I'm like, no, how is that not an issue? But then if you put yourself in their shoes, I see exactly what you're saying with the fatigue. Um, but really wonderful points, Jean. Thank you so much. And Ben, over to you. Yeah, look, brilliant. I think, I mean, my my brain is just um, going around in circles. There's so many intelligent people in this room just making such wonderful comments and such great statements. But you're right, we're preaching to the converted. Natalia, you made a point, you know, we're not necessarily looking for a revolution, but actually we are. This is the 2020 revolution. We're living it. This is it. We're fighting for it. And I understand. As a Russian, I just cannot ask for revolution. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Maybe Sorry. not the Russian revolution. Maybe not the Russian revolution. But we look, I, I think it's really challenging. You know, I, all I can talk to is, is what's true to my heart. And we fought so hard for marriage equality and yet only 62% of people voted yes, right? But we got there and the rest will come over time. They will come the same with women's vote, uh, rights to vote. It wasn't a majority. It took a few men to stand up and say, Hey, actually there's some credence in this. Let's do it. That's what's happening in the world today. It is a new type of conversation and there will always be a fight. But I have two things to say about that. One, money makes the world go round. Anyone that says that it doesn't is lying to themselves. I know it's capitalism and I know it's shit, my, my language, but it is true. Prove to people that you won't take from their purse and you won't take from their home and they will vote with you. 
it is hard. It is a hard message to sell. But we're not taking anyone's money and we're not taking anyone's privileges and they will come with us on this, on this journey. The second thing is we need to prove to them that it is the right thing to do and the way to do that is target the children. The younger generation are being raised without all of that conditioning. They see their brothers and their sisters, black, white, gender, doesn't matter. Internet connectivity or not, doesn't matter, whatever it may be. Every generation progresses us. That's evolution, right? That's literally human evolution. That's just how it works. Every generation comes with new ideas and new concepts. Target them. It's hard. It will take time, but we will get there. I promise you, this is our revolution. We're living it, and we're rewriting the history books right now. As you joke about the Tsars and the Russian Revolution, in 100 years' time, they're going to talk about Black Lives Matter. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Um, Salah, and you wanted to say something. I hope you got, I hope I got your name right. Sorry. I, uh, I just wanted to say to you how amazing this is to be together. I've been in the multicultural and diversity sector for at least 45 years. So <laughs> you can imagine I've been through a few decades of change. This is amazing to be in this group and to hear such wonderful, um, awesome um, remarks because I have seen, and you all, you are, I, I like Jean's questions as well. Um, I, I was a diversity health coordinator and I was the token person for many, many years, as you always are when you are a migrant worker, you're a cultural community development worker, you're always alone. I realised when the margin widened was when refugees came in and it was when some people started to realise it wasn't up just to the ethnics to start doing the work. It meant other people had to be involved. Uh, yet, however, what Ben said, it's, I think you said that this, Ben, was the fact that mainstream and white Anglo-Saxon kept dividing about them and us because they didn't really feel like they were in the multicultural circle at all. I remember when in playgroups in 80s, people would say, well, what culture are we going to have today? When it was Australian culture, they were lost, completely lost. What would they bring? Well, I said, well, what about Vegemite sandwiches? As simple as that, people wouldn't really identify themselves as part of the circle. My philosophy has always been that we are a circle with a square trying to get on top of each other, but we all have to drop our hands and make and form a new, a new shape, whatever that looks like. And so Ben, yeah, I totally agree with all of what you've said. I'm so excited. I've got butterflies fluttering around going, oh my God, it's still going. What surprises me still, how far we have not got at the same time, look at the faces around. We can do so much more work. I'm actually in self-leadership now, and I've had to learn through my identity about who I'm not. And Chinese will still say to me, but you don't look Chinese. No, you're not a real Chinese, but that's okay. I can, I can wear that now. I would have bawled my eyes out 10 years ago, you know, like, so I've really had to work on self-leadership. And that's what I think it's about. It's about us being self-leading ourselves to stand up and have that voice, like Lewis said. We've got to do this. I've been around for too long. I, I used to think it was just for my grandchildren, <laughs> but I love to be living that moment where this really does happen. So I reckon we are, I won't use the word revolution, but we are definitely in awesome space and I'm trusting the universe. We're going to do it this time. I'm with you guys. Uh, fantastic. Um, Brilliant. Well, yeah. well done. I'm always here. I'm always happy to talk to people. This subject never goes away from me. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for all the organizing as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, I see, Christine, you've raised your hand too. Um, I could let you say something, but it has to be absolutely short because we're almost at the end of it. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. My name is uh, Christine. I'm of African uh, descent. So um, diversity and inclusion, I think just in summary for me, I think 
one of the things that I've learned, certainly uh, my biggest takeaway has been, it's not an us and them situation. The more you can um, find the entry point into um, the next, the axis of power, as I would like to call them, um, that's the decision makers around the table, to actually get them interested in the things that are of interest to you, you tap into the things that are of interest to them. It is actually in their commercial interest, in their KPI interest, to be interested in diversity and inclusion for their organization. There's enough literature floating around the place to back that conversation up. You just need to change the paradigm shift of how you have that conversation um, with people. And one of the things certainly um, that I'm learning is about, you know, meet people where they are, you know, in terms of starting the conversation. Everyone on here um, totally gets it. Everyone here is, um, you know, the converted. We're speaking to ourselves. But we're not the ones that are at the boardroom. We're not the ones that are employing hundreds of thousands of people that are, you know, making decisions that are impacting hundreds of thousands of people's lives. So my passion is getting into those leadership groups, getting into those um, stratospheres which have historically been impenetrable for migrant communities. For example, I cannot name a director general of any government agency across any level of government in Australia that's led by a person from a multicultural background, even looking at deputy director general. So, you know, those kinds of things are, you know, are institutional. And so I think having conversations at that level, you kind of have to think, well, how do we um, make it as much their issue and get them as passionate as they are, as we are about it? That's all. Bravo. Bravo. This is amazing. Um, I've, I've literally, I'm just enjoying the discussion. And if it were up to me, I would honestly want to carry on all night because this is something that absolutely inspires me, charges me. And I'm sure it does to all of you because the participation has been absolutely phenomenal. So thank you all a round of applause for all of you. Um, Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our audience. Thank you, Bessie, for hosting. Absolutely important messages. Um, really important that we all find our own voice, um, find our own power, lead ourselves to further lead change. And I think the bottom line is we have to feel and be the change that we want to see and ensure that we do our part and raise our voice when needed. Um, so on that note, I'm going to conclude tonight's event. Thank you so much for being a part of it. And we're going to open the Slack channel. So the discussion over there can be absolutely endless and never stop the discussion because there's a real power in it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Hope everyone have a good night. Likewise. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>